Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, the topic I'm going to be talking about today is uh, high frequency circuits that are bent and flexed. And I've ran into this many times in the industry. And uh, a lot of electrical engineers that are really pretty savvy with the electrical side of this, they sometimes struggle with the uh, mechanical side of this. So uh, this is the agenda I'm going to go through. I'm going to first give you some very basic theory. It's really mechanical theory more than anything else. After that, some uh, material properties that are pretty critical. And then uh, after that, I'm going to talk about some modeling capabilities and how you can do it yourself, really, and give you some uh, real life experience as well. Uh, so to begin with the theory, uh, again, this is pretty much mechanical theory. Uh, you can think of the printed circuit board as a beam. Um, maybe it's a diving board, but something very rigid is a beam, and it's a composite beam. So it's made up of different materials, obviously. There's copper, there's uh, the substrate made up of different things, uh, glass uh, reinforced fiber is multiple things. And each one of those components have their own uh, modulus. And modulus is a really important topic for uh, flex circuit uh, or any kind of flexible application. Modulus is how stiff the material is. A higher modulus material is a stiffer material, lower modulus, softer material. So the printed circuit board, as you put all these materials together and make a printed circuit board, it has all these different uh, mechanical properties on the different layers as you bend this and you apply a bend radius. When you apply the bend radius, you're actually uh, uh, making the uh, strain inside the circuit increase. So you're, in, you're actually inducing a strain in the circuit and that strain is going to be different on different layers within the circuit. So understanding the strain within the circuit, understanding the bend radius and what's that doing, that has a large impact on being able to bend and flex a circuit without cracking conductors, which is obviously the goal. So along with the same uh, idea here with the mechanical theory, the uh, cross-sectional view that I'm showing here is a very simple circuit. And this is actually uh, something that's pretty common in the flex circuit industry. In fact, this is exactly the uh, circuit construction you would see inside of a hard disk drive. Uh, not the solid state hard disk drives, but the hard disk drives for the last several decades where you have a material that's flexing hundreds of millions of times in its life. And really what it is is you have substrate, copper, substrate. That's it. Just a single conductive layer. And uh, this is a good model to think about what's going on for strain and different things uh, inside of a circuit as you bend it. So if you think about this, and I think I have a very simple way to visualize it. I'm a visual guy, so I think everyone else is. Uh, so anyway, if you put a bend on a circuit, then really what you have is on the inside radius of that uh, bend radius, that material is actually in compression from strain, strain and compression. Material on the outside is actually strain and tension. So the material that's in tension, it's actually trying to be ripped apart. The material that's in compression is being pushed together. Someplace in there, as you transition through, there's a point where you have no strain, no stress, and that's the neutral axis. And the neutral axis is extremely important to know where that is in the circuit construction for modeling and actually understanding how much strain is on the different layers of the circuit. Um, now, this is a good example of uh, a couple of varieties to think about to kind of drive home the neutral axis idea. Uh, so the first one is our baseline circuit, which is the upper left circuit. And that's just a very simple single conductive layer circuit with substrate top and bottom. And uh, the neutral axis is going right through the geometric center. And that's because the material top and bottom of the copper has the same modulus, same thickness, same everything. And the neutral axis, where there is no strain, is going right through the middle of the copper. The amount of strain that you're interested in is probably the substrate copper interface. Oh, uh, my pointer's not working. Anyway, the, the area that you're probably interested in most of all is usually the copper substrate interface between the copper and the substrate. As you bend it, that's the area that our cracks are going to want to initiate. And the distance from the neutral axis to that interface is very important. And as that distance is greater, the strain is greater. So what's interesting is if you take the baseline circuit and you move over to this guy, this is the exact same circuit, except it's now thinner copper. So this is, we're going to assume one ounce copper. This we're going to assume is half ounce copper. What's interesting now is it's still a balanced construction, so the neutral axis is still going through the middle. But the distance from the neutral axis to the critical edge, the copper substrate interface, is less. And less distance from the neutral axis means less strain. If you have less strain, the probability of cracking conductors or fracturing conductors is much less. Less strain is a good thing. Uh, another example would be this guy, same as this in construction dimensionally, except the top substrate layer is a high modulus layer. So it's much higher modulus than the other substrate layer. The neutral axis will automatically move toward the higher modulus layer. And what that does is the copper substrate interface on top is actually now lessened because that's closer to the neutral axis. It's closer to zero strain. Uh, 
but the distance uh, to the other interface, the copper substrate interface on the bottom, that's a greater distance, and that means there's more strain there. And that means that's more probable of cracking whenever you put a bend on it. And then this last example is the same as the first one, except it's got a thinner substrate. And thinner substrate, in this case, off-balances the neutral axis, and the neutral axis shifts down toward the higher modulus area or where you have more volume. And now the distance from the neutral axis to the copper substrate interface is greater. And in that case, you should have higher strain, which means when you apply a bend, there's more probability of making cracks at that interface of the copper and the substrate. So uh, more things to think about. There's uh, four items that are really important when you're thinking about flexing and bending. And uh, the four items are bend radius, and that kind of makes sense. I mean, if you uh, apply a bend radius, it's a very gentle bend radius, a large bend radius, that's not going to do much. If you apply a very small bend radius, and you're really putting a lot of strain inside these different layers, that's going to definitely do something. So bend radius is a really big deal. Uh, neutral axis location for modeling and understanding what areas and what layers of the circuit are problematic or could be, that's really important to know. The modulus, how stiff each layer is, that's also important to know. And then uh, finally, understanding the strain on the different layers, that's also extremely important to know. In the table that I've shown here to the right, I'm showing some modulus numbers, and these are kind of generic. Uh, but there's a couple of things you notice. One is the materials that are associated with this are uh, non-woven glass, so there is no woven glass in these materials. The other thing is the modulus is outstanding for copper. Copper is the dominant force when it comes to modulus. And what that means in a multi-layer circuit, if you have multiple layers of copper, if you have very thin layers of copper, that means the overall uh, modulus of the circuit is going to be less, which means when you apply a bend radius, there's going to be less strain applied. And if you go the opposite way, you have many layers of copper and you have very thick copper layers on each copper layer, that means when you apply a bend radius, the strain applied to any one of those layers is going to be more. So copper is a really big deal to understand, not only where the neutral axis is in comparison to copper, like the previous slide, but also how thick the copper is, even the percentage of copper on the different layers. If you have a power plane layer and you cross hatch it, make it less than 100% copper, that actually helps a lot. Uh, let's see. Now these are uh, issues that I'm recommending you not do. This is what you really shouldn't do. And the first one is using laminates with glass reinforcement. And there's exceptions to just about every one of these. And the first one is if it's a glass reinforced laminate, I'd say don't use it if you're going to bend and flex it. But if you have to, then a very gentle large bend radius is going to be okay. But again, uh, the best thing is to use a laminate that is non-glass reinforced. The next thing is uh, plated through hole vias. Uh, you do not want to have plated through hole vias in the bend area. In a lot of RF applications, you have no choice. You need to have a good ground return path. Uh, so in that case, what you want to do is have the PTH vias away from the signal conductors. And then uh, nickel plating, that's just one issue. There's other metal plated issues. But nickel plating is, uh, nickel itself is brittle, so it can initiate a crack very easily. But there's also intermetallic uh, between the copper and the nickel itself that's a stress concentrator. And as you apply a bend, that stress concentrator will actually initiate a crack very rapidly and propagate. So nickel in the bending area is not a good thing. Uh, and you could say that for actually several metals just because of the intermetallic uh, reaction between the metal and the copper. And then ED copper for the laminate, that's usually uh, not recommended. There are exceptions. There are certain ED coppers that are pretty good, actually. Uh, not many, though. And I'll explain that in the next slide. Usually you want to use rolled copper, rolled annealed copper. And then finally, uh, copper plating. Uh, if it's a plated through hole circuit, then you have to plate copper around the holes. And if you have that scenario, what you want to do is have selective copper plating around the holes only and not copper plate the uh, area of the circuit that actually is the bending area. Now, I have a lot of people saying that uh, ED copper should be better than rolled copper for bending and flexing. And that's kind of a rigid board mentality. When you talk to people in the flex circuit industry, they know that's not true. And the reason why is because ED copper, uh, most ED coppers actually have better elongation properties than rolled. So you automatically think if it's better elongation, it's going to do better. Well, that's because the way they're testing it. They're basically doing an elongation test where they take the copper and they stretch it in a plane and they figure out ductility and elongation. But that's not how a flex circuit's used. A flex circuit actually bends it. And if you bend a ED copper and a bend a rolled copper, you're going to find the rolled copper is going to bend much easier without cracking. And a lot of that is uh, grain structure related. So in the case of ED copper, the uh, grain structure is typically a uh, columnar. 
So if you have these mountains and valleys of ED copper, as you bend it, you're basically stretching the peaks apart and the valleys open up a crack and the crack goes right through and that's it, you get a dead circuit. In the case of rolled copper, it's much smoother surface to begin with and that smooth surface helps um, not allow the initiation of cracks. But then again, the grain structure itself is also a different scenario to where it doesn't allow the initiation of cracks very easily. And then when the cracks do initiate, it's very difficult for them to propagate all the way through and create a complete open circuit. So rolled copper is a big deal in the hard disk drive industry. It's been around for decades. That's all they will use. They, they won't even consider ED copper easily. So here's a quick example of um, a microstrip transmission line that's based on uh, 5 mil 3003. So you got a signal conductor on top, a ground plane on the bottom, and applying a bend radius. And if you uh, want to put this into Excel, I don't have time to go through the details, but anyway, you can calculate R sub zero, which is the neutral axis. You can calculate the maximum strain on the uh, copper interface that you're most interested in. And then from that, you can use the strain number to determine if you're in a range of problematic or not. And how to determine that range is kind of some general rules of thumb. And for the general rules of thumb for a one-time bend, so if you're going to make a circuit bend at one time, just a one-time bend only, then typically the rule of thumb is the bend radius needs to be 10 times the thickness of the circuit. The other rule of thumb is the strain on the copper should be no more than 2%. Then if it's a dynamic flex, where it's actually flexing back and forth continuously, the rule of thumb is the bend radius should be no greater than 25x. And also the, uh, the, the strain that's calculated, if you have a hard disk drive or you want to have hundreds of millions of cycles, you'd want to have strain less than 0.2. And like a notebook computer that I used to work on years ago, uh, usually you want to have 0.8% strain or less. And that'll get you around 30 to 50,000 cycles. Running out of time, so I'm going to speed up just a hair, unfortunately. So looking at this same um, uh, microstrip transmission line and then looking at some models. So this is my model strain calculation. This is a bend radius that I applied by a mandrel. And this is not quite as trivial as just bending it around a mandrel. There's actually a little more to it than that. But you can see, basically, as you get to a smaller bend radius, of course, the strain is going to increase. And you can also see where I had copper fracturing at was uh, actually beyond 2%. So the 2% number as a rule of thumb is actually a pretty good number, uh, but you can violate that a little bit. And then last, uh, this is actually a real life circuit that was uh, a flex circuit. I mean, it's actually a high frequency circuit and capable of very high frequency, but it's also being bent in the application. And the only thing that we could actually change in this by design was actually the copper thickness itself. So I ran models on this and you can see the percent strain on the different layers. And you can also see as I go from one ounce, half ounce, quarter ounce, the thinnest copper actually had the best case scenario for uh, the minimal strain. Also, what's interesting is the signal layer, which is buried, had the least amount of strain, which it should have, because it's the one closest to the neutral axis. It should be going right through the middle of the geometry, pretty much. And then the outer ground planes, they have the highest strain, and that's the way it should be, too, because they're the farthest from the neutral axis. And I know I went through that really quick. I apologize, but just a lot of information I wanted to give in a short period of time. I think I might have a minute or so for questions. Do you have an study? Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, do you have a study showing the variation in permitted and dissipation factor given by the bending? Um, say that again, please. Do you think that there is a variation in the permittivity or the dielectric properties of the substrate after the bending? Oh, uh, I've never done a study like that. So the question is basically, as you bend the circuit enough, do you actually change the, the electrical properties, the permittivity? Uh, I doubt that because the first thing to usually go, if you look at the, the sequence of what happens in flex cycle testing, you usually get micro cracks between the copper and the substrate and then that kind of propagates and gets ugly. The substrate itself usually doesn't crack or deform or do anything bad until things really get bad in the copper. So usually the copper causes a high resistance before the substrate starts getting deformed or really messed with. So my intuitive thing with no data is saying that it probably wouldn't matter, but I have no data to back that up. Yes, sir. Uh, are, do the rule, rules of thumb still apply if, if you have nickel gold plating on top of the copper? Not so much. Yeah, we've, we've been down that path a lot. So when you put nickel, nickel gold plating on the copper, uh, that nickel is so brittle it wants to crack right away. And also the interface between the nickel and the copper wants to break right away. So these rules of strain and everything don't apply very well. I think that's all I have time for. Thank you very much.
great, thanks. Oh, cool.